Okay, you've seen the title. These are the two highest end 2020 flagships from OnePlus and Samsung. I've used both for a fair bit of time now and today we're gonna declare a Android smartphone king. Also, alongside this video, I've launched another one comparing the normal OnePlus 8 with Apple's iPhone 11 because that phone was basically built to be an iPhone killer. So after you've seen this one, then do check that one out too. In case you were wondering, this is the package OnePlus sent out to me. It's the media kit, which has a few cool things inside. For starters, a beefy reviewer guide. I'm talking a 60 page read over here and two official cases. One is the sandstone bumper, which I mean, it feels okay. Solid all round protection with a textured finish on both the outside and inside, but it is just a sheet of plastic. The second though is the carbon bumper, which I think is slightly nicer. It's part TPU and part Kevlar. It still feels slim and light, but does have a nice matte finish on the outside, texture on the inside. And finally, this is the retail box of the phone. So if you hopped into a store right now, well, this is the box you'd get. And I would go as far as to say that the combination of what it looks like and what you get in here makes this one of my favorite boxes ever. The phone is on top and below that, you get this elongated insert, which has a couple of cool things inside. Some information cards, a sheet of OnePlus stickers and the invitation letter, which has the SIM ejector tool attached onto it. This is just basically OnePlus saying, hi there, yeah, thanks for buying me. There's more though. I'm a big fan of this case they've added in there. It's not just some lazy generic TPU sheet. It's got the Never Settle slogan in big text. It's got a matte finish on the rails, texture on the inside, and a little designed by OnePlus text. There's a USB-C cable for charging and a 30 watt warp charger. This is fast. The eagle-eyed among you might've noticed that OnePlus has actually rebranded since their last phone. Everything is now in all caps with a slightly bolder logo. Anyways, holding these two phones together, you'll notice something. The OnePlus 8 Pro is a big phone, but Samsung is slightly bigger in every dimension. You'll almost miss it at a glance, but because it's bigger from all angles, it's taller, thicker, heavier, wider. And so when you add all those together, this feels like a middleweight versus heavyweight situation. Like no one ever wants to drop their phone on their face when they're scrolling in bed at night. But I get the feeling that if you did do that with this phone, <laughs> you'd be out for a few days. And as a result, almost by default, OnePlus is the more ergonomic, palm-friendly offering. But on top of that, its smaller dimensions are combined with a slightly curved back and a matte finish if you go for the top-end model. This I'm a fan of. In the UK at least, the two color options you get are glossy black and this greeny blue color, bordering on being a little plain, but still. It's done well, and some color is still better than no color, like the Samsung, which comes in either black or this exciting gray color. Oh yeah, and neither phone has a headphone jack, but OnePlus does have a dedicated slider for switching between ring, vibrate, and silent. The only real design negative for OnePlus is the enormous camera bump. It was pretty much my first observation when I took the phone out of the box. But let's not forget, Samsung sticks out just as much, but it's wider too. If you're gonna use a case, neither of these is a big deal because they'll even out the back. But if you're going bare, the protrusions on either side are enough that you can't really use these phones sitting on a flat surface. Okay, anyways, the traditional OnePlus smartphone strategy has always been to cut a few corners, to make a phone that is nearly as good as the top level flagship phones, but much cheaper. That's changing. This time around, the OnePlus 8 Pro is edging ever closer to costing as much as a flagship. I'll come to this, but now with little, if any, compromise. For example, past OnePlus phones, they skipped an IP rating, they skipped wireless charging, but now you've got both. And in fact, OnePlus wireless charging has gone from being non-existent to now actually ahead of Samsung's. It can charge with 30 watts of power versus 15 on the Ultra. And displays. Samsung really is the one to beat when it comes to smartphone screens. But for my preferences at least, I would go as far as to say that OnePlus has actually just done that. They're similar screens. Both phones actually use a display made by Samsung. They both have insanely high Quad HD Plus resolutions, AMOLED technology for deep contrast, 120 hertz refresh rates for liquid smooth performance, and built-in technologies to reduce the amount of blue light emitted, which is just better for your sleep cycle. A similar size too, 6.78 inches versus 6.9 inches, but a few differences. And the key one for me actually being brightness. I almost couldn't believe it. The OnePlus looks significantly brighter than Samsung's. I've tried indoor, I've tried outdoor, same Result. We're talking a screen so bright that sometimes I would find myself not bothering to use the torch, but instead just turning my phone around and using the display. Oh yeah, and OnePlus can keep running at Quad HD plus resolution whilst having its 120Hz refresh rate on. With Samsung, it's a case of deciding, do I want an ultra sharp display or do I want an ultra smooth display? And on top of that, 
yes, there is more. OnePlus claims they further extend their lead with something called MEMC technology. It's a piece of software that tries to combat the fact that we've got displays here that refresh 120 times per second, and yet most videos are filmed at 24 or 30. So when you're using certain apps like YouTube on this phone, it can actually insert extra frames to make the video appear smoother. But after a bit, I turn the feature off. It causes extra battery drain, and to be honest, while it does look beautiful on videos that are already filmed at, say, 60 frames per second, when it's trying to upscale videos that are filmed at like 24 or 30, the end result's frame rate is kind of all over the place. It kind of judders. Both phones have an almost identically sized hole punch. Do you want it on the side, or do you want it in the middle? It is completely up to you. Me personally, I'm a corner hole kind of guy. You lose symmetry, but it means that when you watch videos, the hole punch kind of disappears. Generally, when you're watching something, your eyes are kind of focused on the center of your screen. So if you have a corner hole punch, it's kind of further into your peripheral vision. The last thing I did notice is the extra curve you get on the 8 Pro's display, which for the most part is just a subjective thing. But I will say that it's just enough of a curve that in some rare cases, when I was holding the phone with one hand, my other fingers would be triggering the edges. And this doesn't seem to happen on the Samsung. And one thing I've really got a hand to Samsung is the fact that in the last few years, they've brought their phones up from being some of the more bloated and sluggish offerings to actually some of the snappiest. OnePlus used to have a very clear speed and actually even battery advantage, but I think it's starting to fade. And let me be very clear, this is not a case of OnePlus getting slower by any stretch of the imagination. The 8 Pro is blistering fast. It's just a case that actually Samsung has caught up and we're at a stage where I really can't tell much of a difference between them anymore. Both phones have those ultra fluid 120 hertz displays and pretty much the best specs you can hope for. Top end chipsets, a ton of RAM, up to 12 gigs on OnePlus and 16 on Samsung and fast UFS 3.0 storage. The only caveat with the Samsung is, and we've gone through this, is the fact that there's two different versions of the phone depending on which region you're in. And long story short, if you get the Snapdragon version in your region, you're good to go. This is a really fantastically performing phone. But if you get the Exynos version, not so much. But the full detail is linked somewhere here, so you can check that out. I guess the point here is that no matter what region you're in, with the OnePlus you'll get the better Snapdragon chip. Even the speakers on the OnePlus are top level. This is another corner the company has historically cut, but not anymore. You get one on the front, one on the bottom. Vocals and instrumentals just sound so crisp. And I would say the volume is comparable between the two. So, at this stage, it's starting to seem a little bit like a home run for OnePlus. It seems as if it does pretty much everything the S20 Ultra does, but just at least as good or better. And it's far cheaper. So, does the S20 Ultra even have a place? Well, the one area where I can see OnePlus has saved some money versus Samsung is the camera system. And so while Samsung has a massive 108 megapixel main sensor, OnePlus has a smaller 48 megapixel one. It's a new sensor. It's an improvement from last gen, but not as good as Samsung's. Samsung has a high resolution telephoto camera that can do 10 times hybrid zoom. OnePlus can do three times hybrid zoom. And they both have pretty comparable ultra wide cameras. But this is where it gets weird. These are both quad camera systems. Samsung's fourth is a time of flight camera to detect depth, but OnePlus's fourth is something called a color filter camera, or in other words, a camera that can view the world in a slightly different way. And I'll give it this. It has been fun walking around and just seeing how different normal day-to-day -day objects look. But honestly, I have really tried to give this thing a chance and I just don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. The camera is low resolution and it doesn't let nearly as much light in as your main camera. In a best case scenario, your output's gonna look like a really old film. And in a worst case, it'll just look like something's gone wrong. Maybe someone will find a really cool use for it. But considering that in my brief of the phone, the company barely touched on it. And considering that the setting for using this camera is hidden away in the filters menu, it suggests that OnePlus isn't that confident in it either. That said, I spent most of my time with the OnePlus camera actually just being taken aback at how much they've improved the rest of it. It may be cheaper hardware than what's on Samsung's, but in almost every situation, the output is at least as good. Past OnePlus phones had some potentially wonky color processing. None of that here. Photos look true to life and crispy with nice depth of field, thanks to a pretty large sensor. And video. The video colors and the dynamic range are stunning and lifelike. It feels like OnePlus has gone right back to the drawing board and built a completely new color processing algorithm that just works. My only current gripe is that, while well, yes, that dynamic range is gorgeous, the focusing is not, or at least it isn't yet. 
And funnily enough, it just so happens that this is also an issue for Samsung, but detailed camera comparison coming very soon, so if you could subscribe for that, that would be amazing. A few final things to note. Both have in-display fingerprint scanners and dual SIM functionality, but with the Samsung, you can actually use one of those SIM card slots to double as extra expandable storage. I also slightly prefer the haptic engine on the Ultra, but you get good general vibration feedback on both, and in terms of charging speeds, you won't have a problem whichever way you turn here. The crucial factor here, though, is that it just so happens that Samsung's high-end is 50% more expensive than OnePlus's high-end. You are getting a more impressive spec sheet with the Samsung. You're getting those extreme numbers that you're paying for. Things like a 108 megapixel camera versus 48, a 5,000 milliamp hour battery versus 4,510 on OnePlus, 16 gigs of RAM versus 12, and so on. But from my time with it, these extreme specifications don't really translate to an extreme experience. In its defense, I think the S20 Ultra gets more flack than it deserves. This is a beastly phone, providing you get the Snapdragon version. But I really think the only people it applies to are people who are really interested in the Galaxy S20, but who are willing to pay more. The Ultra looks really impressive next to Samsung's own lineup, where you can see side by side each extra thing you're getting for your money. That extra RAM, that bigger battery, that further zoom on your camera, it seems worth it. But when you kind of take the Galaxy S20 Ultra out of that context, when you pitch it against aggressively priced competition like this, I think the value proposition of the phone crumbles. And so I think it's pretty clear between the two, OnePlus wins. Don't forget to check out the video I made on the OnePlus 8 versus iPhone 11. I think it's really interesting. And with that being said, my name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.